guys. Where are we? Why would he leave his own country to come here? Free cable. Please tell me that was some kind of a code. In a world where truth is stranger than fiction, our journey through the labyrinth of reality will challenge everything you know. Welcome to the Red Pill Diary. Join me, I'm Lewis, your host, as we dive into the underbelly of our society where secrets lurk and the red pill isn't just a choice, it's a revelation. They say ignorance is bliss, but what if the truth sets you free? Are you ready to see the world for what it is? I've turned the lights on for us. Located on an island in the North Atlantic Ocean is an extinct volcano that forms a peninsula extending into the sea. Mount Brazil rises out of the ocean on the southern end of Tessera Island, part of the Azores, a volcanic island archipelago of Portugal, consisting of 153 square miles of small hills, lush evergreen patchwork pasture land, and Lege, a flat level plain on the northeastern part of the island. Mount Brazil's jewel, the port city of Angua de Shremo, is filled with bone-white stucco Spanish and Portuguese architecture with bright terracotta roofs baking in the sun, a striking contrast with the evergreen background. The Portuguese settled the archipelago island in the 15th century, primarily as a way station for ships traveling between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. It's still a way station even five centuries later. It's not a large island, but it is a strategic one. This jewel, a little over half the distance between the Americas, Europe, and Africa, provides Portugal, a small country with global influence, then and in the 20th century. It was the naval port then, but it's now Leges Field, a busy refueling station for countries worldwide. It's a familiar way station to the United States military, with frequent landings and refuelings of KC-135s, C-141s, C-5s, and others. They all stop to rest, refuel, and now pick up a lone hitchhiker awaiting his ride. The dark-haired man dressed in the solid black casual attire of a rural Catholic priest leaned against the pickup. The humidity was high, but the cool autumn breeze and the constant turbulence from the air traffic kept it at bay. The island was beautiful, he thought, looking south over the bed of the blue Air Force pickup and across the plain. He could seat Mount Brazil in this distance despite the number of active and parked aircraft in front and to his right. He could see the approach into the field on his right and Mount Brazil in the distance to his left. Quite the contrast, he thought, as he looked down at his watch, 1,400 hours. He had arrived a few days earlier to inspect the additional materials shipped on its circuitous journey from an intermediary near the Red Sea. Those carefully packed and covered materials were in the hangar right behind him. He had a few days to wander into the city, far more accommodating than his destination. He turned to see several vehicles, a large fuel truck, and two security police cars marked SP arrive. They would be refueling and securing the vehicle while on the field. He looked down the runway and out into the ocean. The large, sand-colored C-141 appeared to float as it slowly descended and eventually landed on the runway. The telltale blue smoke of heated rubber trailed behind. The giant reversed its engines and began to slow as it passed. It would be a short while, while its cargo would be loaded onto the American champion and on its way to its destination. It was October 7th, 1975. So we're going to start with some backstory. This is going to be oversimplified, but it's relevant. Let's set the stage with, start with Angola. When the Portuguese discovered the estuary of the Congo in 1492, they also found one of the largest states south of the Sahara. One of the few African states this size actually near the coastline. They discovered the kingdom of the Bakongo. In the 17th century, missionaries had indicated there was somewhere near two to two and a half million Bantu people whose capital now would be Mabanga Congo or San Salvador, as it used to be called. It's in northern Angola. In the 19th century, Europeans rushed the continent of Africa to colonize vast swaths starting from the coastline and moving inward to the continent really for insurance against other European countries' claims. It really was an insurance more than it was for economic benefit at the time. They just divided the areas up, what they considered was important for them, but it didn't take in consideration of people groups, and it created this artificial div division that carries over into the present. That's important. This long-standing cultural and colonial dominance over the four or five centuries simmered under the surface coming to a boil following World War II and into the 60s and 70s, where we saw a lot of 
push for independence and decolonization from European holds over these countries after World War II. And these political protest movements such as Pan-Africanism and the movement for decolonization of Africa and other places, but the problem was because of tribalism or nationalism, economic disparities between groups, both in their particular states and throughout sub-Saharan Africa, they had different political ideologies among different nations, and this complicated this vision of unity. Remember Lumumba and nationalism in the Congo, with the Belgian Congo, or Zaire as it's called. Now it's called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, this fracture of these groups created an opportunity for the Cold War rivals, the America, America and the Soviet Union, to influence underneath, trying to find a way to leverage power and control in these independent countries, finding the proxy, because what's important to note in this is that Africa, then and even now, is rich in natural resources, copper, cobalt, uranium, rare earth metals, and diamonds. Of course, there were other things going on. This is a Cold War, as we've talked about in a couple of episodes here. There is a concern of Marxism and communism spreading into these countries because they're vulnerable from being persuaded by the Marxists who then will take over these resources and spreading communist ideology throughout the rest of Africa and beyond. Now, let's give some backstory about what's going on this early part to mid-70s, late 60s, mid-70s in America and Europe. Now, two months after the signing of the Vietnam Peace Agreement, that was in March 29th, 1973, the last U.S. combat troops left South Vietnam. Now, America's direct eight-year intervention in Vietnam was at an end, but other conflicts brewed on another continent. Within a year of that signing of that agreement, the Carnation Revolution also known as April 25th, and it was called the Carnation Revolution because the revolutionaries placed carnations in the barrels of their weapons, and that took place in Portugal on April 25th, 1974. It was a military coup that started because of the dissatisfaction with the authoritarian regime, which had held power since 1968. To some degree, this caught the United States by surprise. However, the United States was working in Africa underneath the surface with some of these independent-minded groups that were pushing for independence from Portugal, like we saw the Belgian Congo in the 1960s, and others. The Carnation Revolution fueled independence movements in Portugal's African colonies, Angola, Mozambique, and Portuguese Guinea. Angola initially gained independence from Portugal in 1975. As it's been the case in several sub-Saharan countries, they suddenly find themselves free of colonial yoke that allows different factions to impose their rule. Angola was no different. In some ways, the Angolan Civil War is similar to the one that had taken place in neighboring Zaire, the DRC, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, remember, Lumumba. So too much was at stake for the West not to intervene in some shape or form, especially during the Cold War, like I said, and uh, the push of Marxists to get into these African countries. After Angola gained independence in 1975, the country descended into civil war primarily between three major factions. Okay, let's briefly summarize this before we go on to our cast of characters. To avoid recent shadow banning, I'll refer to all three-letter agencies as the hand. Any three-letter agency you can think of that relates to our government, or I'm going to call them the hand. Now, due to colonialism and European arbitrary division of states, remember we talked about that earlier, the people groups over the last 500 years, almost all ethnic, religious, political, and humanitarian abuses, there existed a simmering undercurrent in most, if not all, African countries which came to a boil following World War II. The desire for self-determination and unity of purpose, independence movements percolated during the 1960s and beyond. The U.S. deeply committed to rooting out Marxism and communism during the Cold War. Remember the Red Scare and the McCarthyism and all those types of things going on at this period of time. The United States just extracted itself from a losing battle in Vietnam. One year later, it was again working behind the scenes in independence movements, the hand attempting to thwart the rise of Soviet influence in Africa without alerting the public. The Hand was involved in several countries following World War II, many of which 
we have touched on in the episodes 7 through 15. As in most, if not all, the previous incidents, multiple players and interests were at stake. Let's look now at our cast of characters. Okay, so now we're going to get quick into these cast of characters, and then we'll explain how this all works together and what's the, what's the point. Well, let's start with the first three. These three entities were part of the fight with Portugal for independence and also then the three major uh, factions in Angola, one backed by the Soviet Union and Cuba, the other one, other two backed by the United States and its quote-unquote allies. MPLA, it was a Marxist-Leninist group backed by the Soviet Union and Cuba. FNLA and UNITA were backed by the United States. The FNLA was different than the other one because it was focused on trying to restore the historical Congo empire rather than initially aiming for independence. That's the distinction between the two. Remember, the Congo empire was the empire that the Portuguese originally found in that area, which included Angola and the DRC, back in 1492. The next major player in this is Mobutu. He was the president of Zaire following the events that occurred to Patrice Lumumba in 1960s. He is a, what they call a kleptocrat. Basically, he was a dictator that stole everything. And he continued to do that until he was ousted and a Democratic elected another president. And that wasn't until uh, the ni- I think the 90s, 20 years or so. The other leader of the FNLA was Holden Roberto. He wanted, again, wanted to focus on restoring the Congo Empire, whereas Jonas Simbembe, he was a leader of UNITA. He was known for his charisma. He was very charismatic. He had very good strategic acumen, and he employed effective guerrilla tactics. His leadership saw this UNITA control significant parts of Angola, especially in the diamond-rich regions, which funded their war efforts. But these are the two gentlemen that led these two groups independently of each other, but collectively under the support of the United States. So you say, what's the point? Well, let me use a, this is a, an example. There used to be a game where it was a boxing ring and you had a blue guy and a red guy and you would move the person, this plastic piece around and push the button until your hands would hit the chin of one or the other player and you would hit it and his head would pop up and you just push it down and you say, oh, you knocked my block off. Well, this represented your way of having this fight without really actually fighting. And that's essentially what was going on here was that the United States was looking for a proxy in order to fight against Marxism without looking like they're fighting. And the hand was working underneath the system and funneling stuff into these individual groups in order to continue to help them become the ruling parties in Angola without allowing the public and Congress, for that matter, to know that they're actually engaging in essentially a proxy war with the Soviet Union. I'll leave you with this one question. Where are you seeing that today, where we have a proxy war, where the Soviet Union and resources are being put in on a consistent basis, and we're working through a proxy to actually fight in this battle, but not claiming that we're fighting? So let's now return back to this time frame in Angola, what would be the benefit of Mobutu? Remember, he was involved in the coup that took over the Congo from Patrice Lumumba. This is the person that the United States sponsored in that period of time. Why would he be interested in assisting now? Money, loans, favors from the United States to his country, to directly to him and anybody he wanted to shower those gifts with. It was in his best interest to be a conduit for South Africa to work up in in through his country of the Congo and for the United States to work through because of the relationship and the closeness and proximity to these individual countries, the Congo, DRC, and Angola. Now we're going to segue into the other interesting parties involved that are not fighting parties. They're parties that have an economic interest and are tied to Mobutu and UNITA primarily. Let's find out who those people are. Okay, first up and the most important is a man named Maurice Templesman. He was a Belgian-American diamond broker. 
The documents that are out there allege that he had a direct input in destabilizing the Congo, Sierra Leone, Angola, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Rwanda, and Ghana. He was involved in the overthrow, allegedly, of Ghana's first elected president and had a hand in helping the hand assassinate Congo's first elected president, Patrice Lumumba, and help to cover up the hand support of that former president of now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, back then, Zaire Mobutu, who was, like we said, a kleptocrat. He also, interestingly, was a friend of Jackie Onassis. He was also instrumental in creating a marketing niche for in persuading the government to stockpile African diamonds for industrial and military purposes. And guess who's the middleman? He was. He also had a lawyer named Adelaide Stevenson II, who traveled to Africa with Templesman and began working on forming those ties with them, Mobutu being the primary influential and of the Oppenheimer Diamond family and De Beers. He was the director of Lazar Kaplan International, a diamond manufacturing and distribution company founded in New York. His lawyer, Adelaide Stevenson II, is the grandson of Adelaide Stevenson and the vice president under Grover Cleveland. Now, here's the connection that gets this very interesting with the hand. Larry Devlin. Larry Devlin was a field officer for the hand stationed for many years in Africa. He was the hand's station chief in the Democratic Republic of the Congo during the Congo crisis after his Employment with the hand, he settled with his wife in the Congo and became the business agent of who? Maurice Templesman, the diamond, cobalt, and uranium broker who advised the Mobutu government on its dealings. Devlin also socialized widely in the expatriate community of Kinshasa during the late 70s and early 80s. Lawrence Devlin emerged as one of the wealthiest men in Kinshasa. How did that work out for him? Those connections really paid dividends, didn't they? So essentially, we've got three issues here. The hand allegedly was concerned with the expansion of Soviet and Cuban influence in Africa. Angola was a Cold War battleground where the West and communist ideologies clashed. The hand and private business interests supported the anti-communist factions, namely UNITA, led by Jonas Savimbi, and the FNLA against the MPLA. This involvement was part of a broader U.S. strategy, which we talked about, to contain this Soviet expansionism. The other issue was maintaining secrecy. Why? Because America had battle fatigue and anti-war sentiment following the exit from the Vietnam War. The American public was not interested in another war, having lost the war with North Vietnam and the communists in China. They tried to keep it secret from Congress and public scrutiny due to its skepticism towards foreign interventions. Initially, it was funded covertly, but as the spreading increased due to the corresponding Soviet and Cuban buildup, in order to keep up, the U.S. fell behind and Congress found out. Congress passed the Clark Amendment, which legally barred military aid from being provided to the factions in Angola. What'd they do? The hand attempted to circumvent it by paying a proxy, in this case Israel, to purchase arms, who then funneled them through South Africa and Mobutu Zaire. And they paid for mercenaries so they can train, quote-unquote, UNITA and FNL fighters. All of this contrary, arguably, to the Clark Amendment. So how did this all come out? It didn't come out really good for anybody other than the diamond brokers. Maurice Templesman and his hand-picked advisor, Larry Devlin, had deep involvement in African diamond markets and connections with authoritarian governments such as Mobutu. They had a natural interest aligned with stability, and the best place to get stability, at least for this business interest, is a dictator or an authoritarian or a kleptocrat, someone who controls the market for you. You don't need a monopoly in the sense of a in a capitalist system. You get a monopoly if the government makes you one. And what a better way to have a monopoly over the diamonds is to have the people, your proxies, sitting there allowing you to continue to mine diamonds exclusively in their country. Not just diamonds, but cobalt, oil, copper, uranium, 
rare earth metals. Now, does that sound familiar? Have we seen these things occur before? We have. So to answer that question, we're going to go back in time on our way back machine, and we're going to find how this economic interest coupled with the hand, coupled with our government, all came about. I think that's going to lead us down another crazy rabbit trail. Until then, in the next episode, I'll leave the lights on for you. Well, we filled those pages. If you have comments, suggestions, share them. You know, the more input, the more likely a better outcome. I'm moving forward because backwards is not an option. I've turned the lights on here and I'll be leaving them that way. Join me next time on The Red Pill Diary.